Okay, and now we switch immediately to point 16 of our agenda, the role of domestic advisory groups in monitoring uh, the implementation of trade agreements. So it's a really important uh, item that uh, we have a look on the role of the domestic advisory groups. Huh? So we had some experience regarding the case of uh, the Korean agreement, and now we have the Vietnam agreement. And uh, uh, all this has several aspects how uh, DACs are integrated in our work. And um, I am really keen to make clear that uh, we as Parliament recognize the work of the, the domestic advisory groups because these are really the people on the ground uh, who have to live with the trade agreement and therefore it's really important that they have an impact on the work of the, uh, the implementation. And perhaps also we have to reflect how to improve uh, the possibilities of DACs in future trade agreements. So without um, making further uh, introductory remark, I will give first uh, the floor to the chair of the ESC International Trade Follow-up Committee, also member of some DACs, uh, our uh, uh, friend um, Tanja Buzek for three minutes, please. Thank you very much, Baron, for the very nice introduction. And um, good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for the invitation um, to your intercession, but in particular to all of you for taking the initiative, putting the DAGs on your agenda. Because I think with this, actually, you're responding to one of the key demands of the DAGs. For our recommendations to be meaningful and to have a real impact, we need to be visible. And also, we need to have all the institutional channels. And of course, we need to break down the institutional silos. So I take this as a very good beginning. I myself, I'm a member of the DAGs on Japan and Korea and also Canada. And I have the privilege to also chair the UK DAG. As you know very well, the TCA is slightly different as an agreement, because for the first time ever, we are monitoring the entire agreement. So uh, with this respect, um, of course, it is very interesting for the TCA, it should actually be a new model um, on how this is going to be covered, as clearly all the elements of um, the agreements uh, have an impact on TSD implementation and TSD issues. And of course, not least the TCA as a model, because for the first time it has an enforceable lack when it comes to the violation of TSD commitments. I also want to be very honest with you. When I started my own DAG work, um, there was a lot of frustration. I think I can speak for many. Because um, it is it's like, how to say, um, today I am extremely proud that we as DAGs, we came together to turn this frustration into action. And the non-paper is clearly a first, let's say, a first product of turning this frustration into action and to give ourselves um, a voice. Um, I'm very happy also that we as an ESC, um, we provide the platform for the DAGs um, in this endeavor. In July, we called for the first ever all DAGs meeting, bringing together all the members of the EU DAGs. We also had the privilege to invite the interchair, but um, uh, during his Strasbourg week, uh, but also Denis Redonné, uh, CTO, and together we were thinking about how we can actually make it possible for us as DAGs um, to deliver. Um, of course, today I'm also speaking uh, partly as the ESC Rapporteur on the TSD review, because I think it is important that this uh, discussion on strength in the DACs is not happening in a silo. We adopted our opinion October last um, year, almost unanimously, I'm very proud of that, with the full support of business workers and wider civil society. In our call for an ambitious TSD review, featuring also a sanctional approach and strengthening the civil society monitoring. So, of course, um, we as DAGs, we have high expectations of this review and I also told Sabine Vion this morning at the Civil Society Dialogue meeting. But for day, today, for this session, I really hope that this is going to be the beginning of a strong collaboration between the Parliament and also with the DAGs. Clearly, we as DAG chairs, we stand ready for any engagement with the US MEPs, with the standing rapporteurs. And um, yeah, let's start the work. So with this, really, I can conclude the intro for setting the scene. Thank you very much. 
Thanks a lot, uh, Tania. And uh, as you might know, indeed, I invited the Standing Rapporteur of the Monitoring Groups to invite the uh, adequate uh, DAC to their work so that they get also input. So, Tania mentioned there is a non paper about uh, the functioning of EU DACs uh, with the title Strengthening and Improving the Functioning of EU Trade Domestic Advisory Groups. And now in, I invite Ms. Anne Wekam, an advisor from the Dutch National Confederation of Christian Trade Unions, to introduce the paper. Please, six minutes. Thank you for the initiative to invite us to speak about the NAM paper. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and thanks uh, to the MEPs who have been active, who reached out to make this happen. Uh, I've seen uh, the letter that was published in your active yesterday uh, and wanted to thank you for the support also for the non-paper. It was also good to hear that the European Commission uh, acknowledged this morning that the docs are the eyes and the ears on the ground uh, and they, that they should be effective. Um, improving the docs. Domestic advisory groups were created as a civil society mechanism for monitoring sustainable development in EU trade agreements. It has almost been a decade since the first uh, meeting of domestic advisory group. Since then, DACs have been developed, reviewed, evaluated at several instances, identifying significant room for further improvement. The issue remains, however, whether DACs can effectively do what they were introduced for. CMV International is member of the domestic advisory groups of Vietnam, the Andes and Central America. As a trade union uh, member, we focus on the rights of workers inside trade agreements. We are tasked with monitoring the trade agreements, but that proved to be difficult at times. What we learned uh, first is that the role of civil society in monitoring and enforcing agreements should start as early as possible, preferably during the negotiations of the FTA. The European Commission should strengthen the provisions in future agreements on establishment and nomination of independent, representative and balanced civil society representation in the DACs. We also learned that funding and administrative support is of fundamental importance to making the DACs effective. So, uh, the non paper as a bottom-up process. When participating in the DACs, we saw that there was room for improvement and that some of the improvements we could already make ourselves, such as establishing clear working programs. But we were not the only organization that wanted to make work of improving the domestic advisory groups. Together with representatives of different organizations across sectors, so from the private sector, the trade unions, NGOs and knowledge institutions, we hosted a meeting on how to improve the DACs. We decided to work on a non-paper as to boost the discussion on improvement. Producing this paper was a bottom-up process. It is based on research, on workshops and feedback from DAC members across, sex across sectors. For example, given during the All DACs meeting that was already mentioned before. In short, there is consensus on what needs to be improved. The non-paper covers proposals that are relatively easy to achieve, as well as broader proposals requiring more institutional overhaul. This paper aims to share recommendations with the Parliament, the EU and partner countries DAC members, with the trade partners, with the EESC, with the CTEO and the European Commission. So in conclusion, what can the European Parliament do? We sometimes share the same frustration on the process on sustainable trade. This non-paper offers a helping hand for improvement. This non-paper is published in a good time, now that the European Commission is working on a 15-point action plan that you also uh, discussed yesterday and today. This non-paper feeds into the work that the Parliament will be doing in the context of TESD agreements. This non-paper gives a comprehensive yet practical approach for improvements. So we ask the Parliament to make the improvements of the DACs part of the TSD review. We would like to ask the intercommittee with the standing rapporteurs and the shadow rapporteurs to exchange with the members of the domestic advisory groups on, implementing of, uh, on the implementation of the TSD chapters. In some cases this is already happening, but still it can be approved. We would like an institutionalized dialogue between the DACs and the European Parliament to offer that exchange and to support DACs with their monitoring. Thank you for your attention and your interest in improving the DACs. Thanks a lot for presenting the non-paper and dear colleagues, I guess you everybody had it in 
uh, her and his file. Now we are switching to some concrete examples uh, of uh, DAGs. Um, and uh, first, uh, I uh, would invite um, our former colleague, uh, Jude Kirten Darling. She is now the president of the Vietnamese uh, uh, Domestic Advisor Group to give us a hint about the practical work of the DAC. Uh, Jude, uh, for four minutes, please. Thanks very much, Ben, and it's um, it's very nice to join this meeting um, this afternoon to present the work of the uh, Vietnam DAG. As you said, I am uh, the chair of the, the Vietnam DAG, and I have uh, the benefits in some respects of having seen um, life um, around this FTA from inside the parliament as a shadow uh, rapporteur, and now um, following the monitoring of the TSD chapter uh, within the domestic advisory group. Um, so I think the context of the Vietnam DAG is well known to all of you, um, and, um, and we have to recognize that that influences very directly our capacity as, um, as, a, as civil society uh, to, to monitor the TSD commitments undertaken uh, within uh, Chapter 13 of the FTA. Uh, the FTA came into force on the 1st of August uh, 2020. The European uh, side of the domestic advisory group group structure was established in January uh, 2021. We had our first meeting um, on the 8th of March uh, 2021. There is an enormous amount of expertise in the domestic advisory group. Many members of the domestic advisory group from all three sections, uh, workers, business and civil society, wider civil society, have direct networks um, on the ground in Vietnam. And our um, that reference that was made about DAGs being the eyes and ears um, inside trading partners is very well uh, represented in the case um, of um, Vietnam. But we're also the youngest uh, domestic advisory group, with the exception of the UK uh, TCA uh, domestic advisory group. And the last uh, year has been um, an exercise in establishing the structures um, in effect around the um, FTA. We've learned much from the experience of others. I fully endorse uh, the non-paper. We have good dialogue with the different parts of the European Commission, the EAS and DG Trade. Uh, we involved the ILO right at the beginning of our work, and particularly the ILO office in Hanoi. And we've also um, worked closely with MEPs um, uh, as well uh, from the start. Um, much, as I said, much of the first year has been focused on getting started, not so much on our side, but rather on the Vietnamese side. It has been an extremely uh, difficult process. Um, we have had to uh, continually push for the Vietnamese domestic advisory group to be established. Um, clearly, uh, civil society space in Vietnam is a is a key um, issue, and um, and we have been extremely united uh, within the European DAG in calling for um, the involvement of as broad a spectrum of civil society in Vietnam as possibly as possible. Um, However, um, up till now, we only have three uh, partners on the other side of the table, one from business, one from um, the worker perspective, and one from civil society and environmental uh, concerns. And we have been following individual cases of um, organizations or individuals who have uh, tried to join uh, the Vietnamese domestic advisory group, but have been either rejected without clear process um, and unclear thresholds that were demanded, or in some of the worst cases have been harassed and in some cases prosecuted for allegedly unrelated offences, but which we fear are because they have shown an interest in being part of the system. Finally, um, on our side, inside the EU uh, domestic advisory group, we have chosen collectively four priorities that we're focusing on with specific work on each of these priorities very quickly. Civil society space and the implementation of the TSD because of the specificities of the Vietnamese situation. The labor law reform and the implementation of the roadmap that was um, proposed ahead of the EP ratification, which is subject to significant delays. Global supply chains and human 
human rights due diligence, and finally, wildlife, trade and trafficking. The one weakness of our DAG on the EU side is that we have few environmental protection organisations, and that for, for us is seen as a, a slight weakness, but getting going, uh, there is a good atmosphere in our DAG, and we have done some really constructive work in the last year. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Jude. And of course, we will look to the roadmap as well. And uh, of course, we have the pandemic and the situation. But nevertheless, uh, this is not an excuse for delaying it for a long, long time. OK, now we switch to Canada. The CETA agreement, you remember. And we have the president of the Canadian Domestic Advisory Group here with us, Ms. Stephanie Gilslane. Please, for four minutes. Many thanks for giving me the floor. Uh, I'm indeed the chair of the EU DAG on Canada. I'm probably the chair of the less problematic DAG, if one could say, but still, it has a lot of experience. It's been there for almost five years, so it, it allows to learn a lot about how we are processing. So I just wanted to give you a bit of an overview of what we are doing and the challenges maybe we've been facing. So. This is a very well-working DAG in the sense that Canada very quickly established domestic advisory groups, two of them, one on environment, one on labor. It could be seen as a challenge, but actually it's working okay so far. We have quite direct contact with our counterparts in Canada, which is very good in terms of promoting a lot of discussion of exchanges on different topics. We also had very good workshop together. Of course, because of the online environment, we could make it very flexible, so in a way, it has helped uh, to create more opportunities to discuss with the partners. Um, you also have what we call a DAG to DAG meeting that is very uh, effective. We reached several times joint statements that were more and more, um, let's say, comprehensive and with clear demands, which is quite helpful. And of course, we got the opportunity to intervene in the TSD committee meeting, meaning in presence of Canada and the EU, which you will hear from other colleagues. It's not always the case. It really depends on the government as it's not... Um, a clear requirement in the trade agreement. So in the case of Canada, the sort of sequencing is, I would say, from my experience in other DAGs, optimal, meaning that usually the DAG meet between themselves as a DAG to DAG. Then you have the joint civil society meeting where the DAGs together can express some common views. And then afterwards, they have the opportunity to talk uh, in the TSD committee meeting. So that's quite uh, powerful. In terms of scope, it was mentioned, the TCA with the UK is the first one to cover where the DAG will have to cover the entire agreement. Um, the EU DAG on Canada is actually the first one that got in the rules of procedure that the DAG would look into all sustainability-related issues wherever in the agreement, not only in the TSD chapter. You might know, I'm not the chair, but I'm also a person working on animal welfare, and animal welfare is not explicitly in TSD chapters, and so, of course, for me, this issue of scope has always been very important. But I have to admit that I'm not sure that the de development we are seeing with the TCA, with a DAG that would be in charge of the entire agreement from the management of tariff rate quota to sustainability is very positive. We've always promoted, with also with the trade unions, to have this angle that a, a DAG should be able to address all sustainability areas, anything related to sustainability in the trade agreement. But I think that overloading the DAG is not always a good option either, in the sense that, yeah, we still need to prioritize, in my opinion, what's related to sustainability. Also, I think that even if Canada is a like-minded partner, a willing partner, it has shown that, yeah, the DAC could not do very much, actually, because of the instruments that we have, because of the weakness also of the language in the trade agreement. It's very hard to demonstrate any violation of the TSD commitments with that kind of language in an agreement. So nothing has really happened. We have been a lot pushing the EU and Canada to act upon the joint instrument that they signed, which aimed actually at reviewing the TSD chapters. But again, the language is very weak. So for instance, on one side for the EU, it means to look at the provisions and decide whether they're fit. For the Canadian, it was more about maybe we should have additional mechanism to enforce the chapter. And now we have dived into a full review of the TSD chapters in general in the EU. So nothing is happening on that front. But still, just to show you that language really 
really matters. And when there's a commitment to review, for instance, TSD chapters, it doesn't mean that they're going to get improved very easily, not at all. Um, I also want to say that, to echo what Jude has said about environmental NGOs not being present, the difficulties to have some results in the DAG also lead to some NGOs, of course, especially on the environmental front, not being willing to engage, and that's a bit of a vicious circle. I will stop there. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, uh, Stephanie. And uh, third uh, example from uh, DAG is the president of the Anden uh, DAG, Mr. Benedict Weidenhofer. And he has also four minutes to present his DAGs. Many thanks, Chair, and, and many thanks for inviting our DAG uh, to this exchange. I'm also advisor at Business Europe, which is a member of all existing EU DAGs. And also, as such, uh, we are happy to contribute to this discussion. Now, many relevant things have already been said about uh, the functioning of DAGs, and I will focus um, on the functioning and priorities of the EU Andean DAG, and I will also highlight some of the challenges we face. Now, on the functioning, uh, <clears throat> as most DAGs, we have between two and three meetings uh, per year as the EU DAG, and at each of them, we also have an exchange of views with the European Commission. Um, and then, moreover, once per year, we have a joint meeting with our Andean counterparts, the Andean DAGs and Andean civil society. Uh, at the beginning of our mandate early last year, we adopted a work program, and I'll now uh, highlight some of the main priorities we identified there. Um, the first of these priorities is the EU DAG declaration. Uh, that's a yearly exercise. Uh, the DAG adopts, our DAG adopts this declaration ahead of the meetings of the EU Andean Committee on Trade and Sustainable Development uh, in order to feed our uh, priorities to the European Commission ahead of the meeting. And the issues we raised uh, over the years consistently and also this year include uh, the persecution of trade unionists and social activists in Colombia, uh, concerns uh, around the freedom of association in Ecuador and Peru, and also the importance of using EU development policy to support partner countries to meet uh, their TSD commitments. The second priority I would like to highlight is one transversal topic we identified uh, and that we delved into more deeply. Uh, that is uh, uh, fair trade in the EU, Colombia, Ecuador and Peru. Uh, and on this topic, we organized a joint workshop to which we also uh, invited the Andean DAG members and we commissioned a desk study. Um, and the third priority I would like to highlight is improving the cooperation with the Andean DAGs. Uh, for this, we consider it essential that, to increase the transparency regarding the composition and functioning of these DAGs. And as a first step to achieve this, we um, prepared a document setting out how our DAG, the European DAG, works. And we've shared it with our Andean counterparts to prepare the joint meetings, because in the joint meetings, we had a point in the agenda where one representative of each DAG was invited to um, say some words to explain to the other participants how their DAG works, for example, how they select members, how uh, often they meet, how they select topics, etc. And afterwards, we had a discussion and an exchange of best practices. Um, now, this is all uh, a learning process, and there has been a lot of improvements in recent years uh, in the uh, functioning of the DAGs, but there is still there are still some challenges, and I would like to highlight particularly two. Um, one of them is uh, the cooperation with our Andean DAG's counterparts that is significantly complicated by the lack of transparency regarding the membership of these bodies. Unfortunately, the Andean governments do not share information on the membership of their official DAG's with the European Commission or our Secretariat. And for a serious cooperation, we would need to be given at least one official contact point in each DAG. Um, we raised this issue consistently and uh, also in the last joint meetings. In the meantime, we've received a, a comprehensive list of members of the Colombian DAG, but we don't have any such information for the DAG of Peru and of Ecuador, and we will keep pushing for this. And the second uh, challenge I would like to raise is um, relating to the T, uh, Committee on Trade and Sustainable Development. We think that the agenda of the meeting of the Committee on Trade and Sustainable Development between the EU and the Andean governments should include an exchange of views with the presidents of the EU DAG and all three Andean DAGs. 
because this is an established practice in other dogs, and uh, we think it would be an important sign that the EU dogs are taken seriously as consultative bodies. But so far, Indian governments have uh, resisted this. Um, in the interest of time, I'll stop here. Uh, I will, of course, uh, uh, be happy to answer any questions you may have. And, and finally, let me also say that uh, the EU and Indag would be very happy to have um, further exchanges with the European Parliament in the future. We stand ready to do so, particularly also with the delegation to the Indian uh, community. Many thanks. Perfect. Thanks a lot. And now I give the floor to our colleagues. First is Christoph Hansen for one and a half minute. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Ben, and it's always good to see former colleagues back. So, uh, Jude, uh, it was a very nice meeting you, even though it is uh, digitally. And uh, maybe I would start uh, to, with a question to you. So, in uh, 2019, the EU launched a, a three-year project of 3 million euros to support implementation uh, of TSD chapters uh, through civil society participation. What can you say us uh, about the results of this project and uh, the impact uh, on the uh, functioning of uh, DAGs in general, but in particular uh, on the Vietnamese ones? That would be uh, interesting for me. Uh, a second question uh, to Mr. Wiedenhofer. Um, in how far uh, are you working as well uh, on the impacts of upcoming legislation, namely on deforestation, because we know that for Colombia, for example, coffee and uh, cocoa exports to the European Union are important. These are plantations, not forests. Uh, what are the impacts uh, as well there uh, on uh, the, the civil society, on the workers, on the spot, if we would uh, go for very strong legislation there? Are you already having exchanges there? And then, a third question as well to a former colleague of mine, to uh, uh, Tanya Buzak, because I was between 2016 and 2018 as well member of the EESC uh, in the employers group, uh, but nonetheless we were colleagues. So uh, um, therefore, I one question to you, Tanya. Uh, in uh, the latest uh, opinion on the role of DAGs, um, the EESC has called for a better representation of consumer interests. Uh, uh, how has this been uh, taken into account uh, so far? So thank you very much for that, and I'm at my time. Perfect. Uno, one and a half minute. Uh, thank you very much, Ben, and uh, me. I, I'm very happy also to see friends and guests uh, uh, speaking so well about uh, the issue today. Um, of course, I, I read thoroughly the non-paper, um, and having listened to you carefully, um, my very question to all of you is, where are the decisive trigger points uh, to improve the working conditions of the ducks, uh, as we saw in your proposals? There's many proposals. The institutionalized dialogue with the European Parliament by far should not be a problem for us, very much appreciated. But if you distinguish the different uh, uh, bottlenecks of the collaboration in, in the, in the DAX, what is, what is the most important points? Is it the funding? Is it uh, uh, the uh, functioning secretariat structures, uh, the establishment of procedural rights? Or would you say, well, in general, the lack of enforcement rules, because if we had better enforcement rules, automatically we come into a better position to, to be a, a, a well-understood partner. And my last question, um, you have made uh, uh, excellent points uh, of the functioning of the EU uh, trade domestic advisory groups. Could you imagine also to do a similar piece on the working conditions that was raised by, by some speakers on the working conditions of the counterparts, because that is very much of interest for us as well, also with an eye on the forthcoming negotiations on trade agreements. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Saskia Brickmore, one and a half minute. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Chair, dear guests. Thank you for your different interventions. I'm so happy that we were able to have this discussion and on behalf of the Parliament. I believe that I can say that this is um, just one step towards what I hope will be many. And indeed, it's very precious for us to have voices from the ground. And I hope it's also the same for the Commission, too, after Mrs. Pratt's interventions this morning. Now, it's important for the sustainability of our agreements that the DAGs are part of the process, but there are also other 
chapters such as health standards, um, market regulations, etc. And there was also the issue of animal welfare that was brought up. And we also needed DAGs to be involved upstream in the process and afterwards. And do you um, share this? Um, so I might ask, do you share this view that this is a priority? And this could be something that could be done in partnership with the European Union and the third countries. When it comes to prioritising such issues, um, when it comes to negotiating free trade agreements, what do you think about this? Do you also believe that your contributions are fully taken into account by the European Parliament? And what do you think about the pre-ratification of agreements, for example, in the case of Vietnam? And I salute Judith for her work in the case of Vietnam. How can we work with a DAG that doesn't exist? How do you see the future of the relations? You spoke about the difficulties when it comes to human rights and the fact that, yes, of course, there um, needs to be some kind of um, bridge built between yourselves and the DAG in, in Vietnam. So I believe that when it comes to... The um, voice of DAGs is still a lot of work that needs to be done. Half a minute. Thank you, thank you, well for Thank you very much, Chair. In my role as standing rapporteur uh, for uh, the um, trade and investment uh, agreement uh, with Vietnam, I'm trying to follow exactly what is happening and try to inform the monitoring group and I also like to try to insist with the Vietnamese authorities on the proper implementation of the agreement. Now, it's no secret that this agreement doesn't always smooth, uh, run smoothly. I have three questions. First of all, what about the most recent uh, development in terms of the DAG on the Vietnamese side and in particular with regard to recent arrests of activists who were candidates for membership of uh, the uh, DAG. Second point, now with regard to the effectiveness and the impact of DAGs on the spot, now studies have shown us that the different VAGs don't always have a lot of impact uh, on the spot. So this is a question really for the Commission. Given the current agreements, where does the Commission see opportunities to improve this? And the third point is how can we as a Parliament receive better information regarding DAGs. What's really missing is an information channel from the Commission. Too often do we have to simply rely on the regular media for our information. And I think that a collation of information should come more quickly from the Commission to the Parliament. Thanks a lot. And Helmut Scholz, one and a half. Uh, thank you, Chair. <coughs> and this is also from for me, a very pleasant to, uh, to meet all of you in this uh, round because from the monitoring groups we have a certain good cooperation knowledge. Um, in a 2020, the researchers from the University of Ghent, which is a fair trade city, um, uh, they analyzed the work of more than 20 uh, ducks and in their study they concluded that uh, there is still a lack of genuine dialogue between ducks and governments. And then they are continuing in certain other aspects. But the final conclusions is that ducks have achieved only limited policy impact and have little political impact and re relevance. So the question maybe to Tanya would be, you have uh, informed us about the, um, the, the ability to to, to monitor the whole trade agreement, what would you recommend to make this a general rule for all ducks? And what does it mean in, in restructuring the work of the ducks? Question to the Commission would be, would you follow up the 21 recommendations presented by the EU ducks? And if not, so what, what you are hesitating uh, in that? And maybe one question to to Benedict is, uh, in the case of the NDAC, we heard that there are still obstacles um, for DAX to meet with the TSD subcommittee. Can the Commission explain why and where you as DAC would expect a, a current so, so the change of the um, approach of the Commission? And finally, maybe also to all of you, how do the complaints procedures for violations of sustainable trade commitments coordinated with the DAX? 
and what role then the ducks and here we are coming in the European Parliament should play um, in, in, in having a new mechanisms to implement that. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And of course, I had also a lot of questions in my mind, but I will only raise two. Is it really useful to have only one duck for everything, uh, specifically regarding the situation that perhaps the duck is responsible for a whole trade agreement? Should it be perhaps an economic duck, an environmental duck, a labor duck, so that we have more focused possibilities? So imagine the Canadian one should also then deal with the cheese quota with, 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 uh, with, with Canada. Um, and secondly, what is your experience in the relation with the EU delegations in the partner countries? So um, I will invite now the um, experts for about, about three minutes, and then we have also Ulrich Weigel from the Commission with us. Tanja, please. Thank you very much for all the interesting questions. I will pick um, a few of them and leave, uh, for instance, Vietnam to, to Jude. Um, coming back to the point of the Hello Christian again, uh, when you said in particular on the consumers, um, this was a challenge from the very beginning because we don't have a specific consumer chapter still in the agreement as such. But we try to do our best to actually also to bring those issues into. We are very happy that we also have uh, sometimes consumer organizations like Bayok also as member of the DAX covering that. But so far we have not truly achieved what we as ESC had requested back then. But this is also due to the interest and to the structure in the agreement itself, I would say. Uh, hi to Udo. Um, uh, definitely, I would say what you say on the, uh, the biggest trigger mechanism. Definitely also the lack of enforcement. This is an issue that we have to tackle with this TSD review. But also, what is in the agreement itself? Because we are currently struggling, for instance, in Japan with the Japanese um, civil society organizations on the other side, because it is a duck to duck meeting is not foreseen in the agreement. And if you have a trade partner who literally takes what is in the agreement, we are struggling. And the same is also for having very precise expectations of the obligations listed to TSD. So this is, I think, one of the weak points of the agreement that definitely needs to be addressed in the TSD review. On the question of the working conditions of other parties, uh, I think it is very interesting to look at the FES study because they have done uh, conducted the only interview ever, also including um, interviews with the partner duck countries. That would be definitely um, a starting point, but also for us, very interesting as an ESC. As Saskia had mentioned, the pre-ratification requirements, absolutely important. We do see it in Japan and Korea, the DAX that I'm also part of. We're still struggling with Korea and Japan not having fully implemented what is said in the agreement. So I think this is another point that that absolutely needs to be um, in the um, in the tier the um, review. Helen, the question on the scope. Um, you're asking the, um, the UK DAG chair, and this is a challenge for us. I think um, I maybe would be more competent to answer that question after a couple of months that we have seen how this is going into TCA. It's a challenge, clearly, uh, but also partly linking to the question of burned. Still, it might be working with subgroups, but I would not advise to split the ducks into several ducks, because I think our strength was always, in particular also on the TSD, because TSD has the social, the labor, the environmental and the economic side. And if you start splitting the ducks, I think that synergy is getting lost. So, But on the work organization, we could think on that. And I think the TCA, the UK DAG, is, let's say, an experiment that I'm happy to steer through with a, a great presidency. And then let's see um, how this is going to work. But my, let's say, my guts feeling tells me, keep the duck together, because we also see with, for instance, with Canada and also with Japan, where they have labor and environment separated. It makes the coordination even more difficult and the synergies get lost. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tanya. Anne. Thank you uh, for the questions. To um, to answer uh, the question that Tanya just answered now on, the, on keeping the ducks together, I really agree with her. That's most important. And one of the recommendations uh, in the non-paper is to work with thematic working groups. That's also one of the uh, things that ducks can do themselves. Some of the recommendations are for the European Commission, some are for us. And this is one of the uh, best practices that we can uh, that we can work on ourselves. 
uh, another uh, question uh, that was asked was, uh, what, what is the main thing? What, what should happen now? Um, and the question was, what uh, is the lack of enforcement rules? That's an important thing, indeed. Uh, with good enforcement, you already uh, achieve a lot. But next to that, uh, key is that the Commission takes on uh, our uh, other recommendations. Uh, then on the uh, complaint uh, procedure, uh, what role DACs can play, uh, CNV International actually is now working on a complaint on the, the single entry point. Uh, so we see the process from inside. And the role of the DACs is now unclear. Uh, for example, in prioritizing the cases, that's mainly up to the CTO, but the, uh, there's no influence on that. And we see a really uh, a good role for the uh, domestic advisory groups there. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Jude. Yeah, thanks very much. And it is really lovely to see you all. Um, I'm glad you're all safe and sound uh, despite this pandemic. Um, coming to some of the questions that um, haven't been um, answered then, uh, the 3 million euros in the uh, 2019 uh, report is essentially uh, the financing for the secretariats and the logistics of the DAGs. And I have to say, from my perspective as a chair of one of the European DAGs, we get great support from the uh, European Economic and Social Committee committee in terms of the logistical organizational support and the secretariat there. Um, but that doesn't, uh, in, in our case, I don't think that that means uh, any major support for the Vietnamese side um, in terms of the DAG. In other cases, the non-EU uh, DAG also benefits from uh, logistical support, I know. So that's that's what that money is for. When I come to the Vietnamese DAG, we do have a Vietnamese DAG. Uh, we had our first DAG to DAG meeting um, in November last year. So we're right at the beginning of the process of dialogue with the Vietnamese side. But the Vietnamese DAG is made up of three members at the moment. Um, if I compare that, that to the European side, where we are normally about 20 people, full members and substitutes in the room, it's very unbalanced. Um, and, um, and we have been following very carefully um, what has happened around uh, activists and organizations who've shown an interest in joining uh, the Vietnamese DAG. Um, there, um, directly to uh, Mr. Bourgeois, um, how can we better cooperate in terms of what's going on on the ground? Really take advantage of the network that was, is within the European DAG. We would love to be um, regularly invited to the monitoring group on the Vietnamese um, FTA. Um, I think there's a lot we can do in terms of sharing um, information and, and expertise about what is, what's going on on the ground, because it's clear that uh, there have been a number of cases where organizations have tried to apply uh, to joined the Vietnamese DAG and have been rejected for unclear reasons, as I said. And there are a number of um, individuals and organizations which have shown an interest in joining uh, the Vietnamese DAG and then have been subject to legal processes, have been arrested. Uh, last week, we had the judgment on uh, two um, uh, a prominent activists who were prosecuted for allegedly different um, offences, but um, we're, we're very aware of how um, uh, the space, the civil society space is closed down in some countries, and it's not necessarily um, an arrest on directly related to the uh, interest in the domestic advisory group, uh, which will uh, close down that space. So we need to have very close exchange with MEPs, um, as we do also with the European Commission so that we're all uh, fully abreast of, of what's going on, the, on on the ground. But we have that network, um, and that network is very responsive to developments, uh, particularly um, in Vietnam. And then maybe just the last point um, in relation to Udo's question about uh, bottlenecks. Uh, there's no magic uh, bullet in the story. We need a strengthening of TSD enforcement. Uh, but a strengthening of TSD enforcement and pre-ratification requirements should should also come alongside a strengthening of, in terms of domestic advisory groups and the functioning of domestic ad advisory groups. And there we would like to see a substantial follow-up from the Commission to the non-paper, which we all contributed to and um, all support. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jude. Stephanie. 
Thank you. I will try to, to pick up on the left one. So to start on the question of Saskia Bricmont on whether there are other issues in SPS chapter, reserve origin, I completely agree. And that's why already as of the, the, the Dagon Canada and also then Japan, Vietnam, we've been pushing to sort of include in the mandate everything that's related to sustainability wherever it lies. But it's true that it, it's difficult. You need to have priorities. And the, as you might know, the Commission now establishes priorities with each country not really in discussion with the DAG, which is one of the issues. And so sometimes you might have the DAG willing to talk about something, and then the Commission has a plan to talk about three other topics, and it can get a bit difficult. So also a better inclusion of civil society and possibly as well the European Parliament in defining the priorities for each topic could be very useful. Um, to talk trigger points and what we said, I completely agree with the previous speakers. I think it goes together. The main issues is the weakness of the language and the weakness of enforcement. Because even if enforcement was stricter, if the language remains too vague, it doesn't work either. And it comes back to the fact that then you have less actors, let's say from civil society, with a bit less funding, because then they can't justify sitting on that group. They can't say anything. We believe it's important to be there, and we try to use those groups to raise issues like, for instance, animal welfare, sustainability in food systems. But not all uh, groups, environmental groups, can afford that. And so it all goes together, and it becomes a vicious circle in a way. And that's really not positive because then one might think that there is no issue with the country, but it's maybe not that. It may be lack of resources. Although we, we get great support, of course, from the ESC, you have to do the content sort of related work. And if we like that, we can't do much. Also on the issue of having one DAG for all, I agree with all the colleagues. I think that having split DAG is not very helpful. We see it with Canada. Sometimes it's a bit complicated because they have two different groups. I think a plenary approach with subgroups would be much better, especially if now we have a mandate for the entire uh, agreement that definitely will be needed because there's already too much. And finally, on the question on the connection with the EU delegation, it depends on the DAG. In my experience on Canada, I haven't had a lot of connection with the EU delegation in Canada. However, in my, I was chair also of Ukraine, and there I had a lot of contact, very good and useful contacts with the EU delegation in Ukraine. They provided briefings to us, and they were quite good source of information. So that could also be improved. I think that in the 15 Action Plan, the Commission aimed at working more with member states, with the Parliament, and I think DAG should be injected in this. I wouldn't find it weird that, for instance, representative of the DAG could attend the briefing to member states by the Commission, similarly as you are trying to do in the EP to involve us better. I think that would be very helpful also to know the contacts and to know who to who to reach out to when we want to know something, because often the DAG provides this opportunity to know exactly who works on the topic at the Commission and who we need to, to talk to when we have a question. Thanks a lot. And uh, Benedict, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, now, um, I'll also uh, pick some of the questions that uh, have been asked. Many thanks for all the questions. First, uh, the question of Mr. Hansen regarding the upcoming legislation on deforestation. We have not uh, specifically worked on this issue, um, and I don't remember that it has been raised by our Andean counterparts, but more broadly, uh, Business representatives, especially on on the Andean dugs, have some concerns with uh, have raised concerns with their ability to meet upcoming EU legislation in different areas. Um, they've raised concerns regarding uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism. They've raised concerns uh, regarding the farm to fork policy and others. And in this regard, I think it's important that the EU also uses its development policy as a means to help actors in partner countries to meet. Uh, higher higher standards and and therefore also contribute to sustainable development. That's that's an important aspect I would I would like to uh, raise here. On Mr. Bullman's question on key bottlenecks, I think for our DAG it's really the um, lack of transparency regarding our counterparts. Uh, more transparency here would really make it much easier for us to engage with them and and for that at least one official contact point uh, that is provided on a regular basis by the counterpart governments for each of their DAGs would would be very. Uh, um, helpful. On Mrs. Pigmont's question on um, whether the trade and sustainable development chapter should be uh, increased to cover other sustainability issues as well, I think it's always important that there is a link to trade because in the end we are talking about trade agreements and of course um, 
uh, from a level pl playing field perspective, it is important that uh, partner countries, for example, meet international uh, standards on, on, on environment, on, on, on labor, and on other TSD-related issues. That's, that's no question. But uh, you always need to justify why uh, things are included in, within the scope of, of, of trade negotiations. And for that, you, you need to, uh, to justify it also from, from a trade perspective. So maybe that, that, that's something I would like to raise in this regard. Uh, Pre-ratification engagements um, is certainly something uh, that could be looked at. But I think it's important that the EU is very clear and transparent from the beginning on what it expects from partners um, and, uh, and, uh, and doesn't, uh, you know, uh, add continuously things as negotiations are already uh, happening um, on uh, um, uh, the uh, whether to split tags. I would also be uh, skeptical towards that. I think it's important to first look at uh, how the UK DAG uh, functions and then draw lessons from it. Uh, there is always a risk also to overburden civil society organizations because also uh, organizations for which the DAG membership is relevant um, have limited uh, resources, and if each DAG is split into several sub DAGs, that of course increases also um, the uh, level of resources that need to be invested. Um, and um, regarding the uh, question on EU delegations, it really depends, as Stephanie said. Um, uh, it, it mostly happens, in, from my experience, when traveling actually takes place. So when DAG representatives travel to the partner country for the joint meetings. And there usually often you have, you have an exchange with a member of the EU delegation as well, but it's rather on an ad hoc basis, I would say. I'll stop here. Many thanks for, for all your questions. Thanks a lot for this uh, really interesting uh, view into the details of the work of the DAC. And uh, I think there are a lot of uh, bottlenecks, uh, as Udo mentioned, and also some uh, uh, room for, for improvement and uh, to reflect how to really strengthen the work of uh, the DACs. Um, and uh, one uh, the Commission should be also focusing on that uh, regarding the uh, work on, on the uh, famous 15-point uh, action plan and the review of that. And uh, I will give now the floor to Ulrich Weigel, and uh, perhaps he can give us some hints in which direction the Commission is thinking about that. Um, thank you. Chair, I have to switch on my camera. Oops. Trying to switch on my camera. Yes, no. Um, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you to all the representatives uh, uh, from, the, from the committee and uh, the representatives of civil society. It's been very good seeing you, hearing you, and uh, as Commission, uh, we have noted the many and very detailed, well thought out uh, contributions that have reached us already. Uh, the um, own opinion by the Economic and Social Committee, piloted by Tanja Putzek, uh, the underlying study by the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, the work by CNV, uh, the discussion of the Old Arcs meeting with Denis Redonnet. It just shows and confirms what we have also seen in the open public consultation and the contributions received there, that transparency and inclusiveness in, in TSD and in trade and sustainable development is featuring very high in, in this discussion. It is very clear that uh, the current mechanisms of involvement of, of business, workers, and civil society organizations is under scrutiny, and that uh, we have heard again that uh, there is uh, many calls and proposals and suggestions for improvements. Uh, we're listening very carefully, and as you said, Chairman, uh, the question of uh, civil society involvement is a distinct feature and has been a distinct topic of the 15-point action plan and has been a distinct part and, and, and topic uh, for the questions we have put in the open public consultation. Now, going back to the 15-point action plan, we have already stepped up our efforts in, in since that point, since that in the frequency and the increase of the engagement that we have with the Economic and Social Committee and the DAGs. Um, we also support, and we are very uh, uh, um, cognizant of the importance of uh, the direct engagements of our DAGs, DAGs on the other side. So we 
very keen to take up uh, the comments and the concerns that, that we are getting. For example, on, on Vietnam, we do share the concerns about uh, the space for civil society. We are very keen and conscious to, to fully understand uh, the facts behind the, uh, the news that are reaching us, and, and our uh, the external service and the delegation and member states are reaching out to the local authorities to, to get that clear. At the same time, uh, we are also taking up the, uh, the concern to further develop and, and bring up uh, the Vietnamese dark to work. And I think there's one element that we can add, that just by the end of December, Vietnam has agreed to double the number of members from three to six. So that is something that we're very keen to work very closely. Um, we also mentioned that project of three million until uh, 2024 that supports logistics and technical assistance, including allowing certain projects uh, or study that, that the ARCs can, can pilot. Now, there is a, a question and a limit to what extent we can use that money also to support other countries and their setting up of DARCs and their logistics and secretariat function. That, as you can imagine, is pretty sensitive. Um, as we would be reaching behind the borders and into the uh, government and institutional setup of, of our partner countries. Um, so, and we would rather would have used them using their organizations, their setup, and ensuring proper ownership and full legitimacy of that contribution to our discussion. Important contribution that it is. Now, as we look forward to, to our work and in, in the context of the ongoing review of trade and sustainable development, uh, this question will remain one of the key questions. It has been, been said uh, this morning, and we can only repeat, yes, we do agree, uh, DAX should play an important role as eyes and ears on the ground that are central to inform us and, and uh, inform uh, everyone with an interest in, in, in the performance and implementation of the agreements um, as to what it is that is the situation, what is the baseline, what uh, are possible priorities, and what are the most effective tools to bring about the change on the ground that we're looking for. And the TSD review is certainly an opportunity to look into those questions into further detail. And that would be uh, Mike's answer also to that question of how would the Commission give follow-up. I think it is now in this process that we would uh, um, look very carefully into all the suggestions that are there and, and make them part of the reflection going forward. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks a lot, uh, Ulrich, and uh, thanks a lot to everybody, uh, specifically to the experts from the DAX, to this lively discussion. And it's always interesting uh, when uh, the EU bubble meets uh, the real life. And, uh, Therefore, uh, uh, thanks a lot for the lot of uh, concrete proposals for improve the work of the DAC. And uh, I'm sure we are learning from the situation at it is, and uh, we are trying to solve them and improve them, uh, uh, specifically regarding uh, the revision of this famous 15-point action plan. Thanks a lot to everybody. Good luck. And... Um, then we close this item 16 and we switch to item 17. And this is also an interesting uh, issue, the CBAM. Uh, this was mentioned today in several uh, occasions as well and with the French ministry yesterday as well. And uh, uh, we have a, a report and uh, now we will have a short discussion about the amendments to uh, the report by Karin Karlsbro. Karin made, I guess, 68 amendments to the proposal, and you got more than 500 additional amendments. So, Karin, for four minutes, it's your turn. Thank you, Bernd, and, and uh, thank you for the possibility to have this discussion here today. Just to repeat, um, the European Union is a global leader in climate protection, uh, but, but as we all know, global action is needed to save our clim climate. And in the EU, we already have a system for pricing carbon emissions. However, many of our trading partners still lack any form of carbon pricing, either through a carbon tax or through an ETS. So, in the absence of 
absence of a global carbon price and a multilateral solution, a market-based carbon border adjustment mechanism, CBAM as we call it, can play an important role. And I'm very happy that we have started to work with our negotiations on the Indo opinion on the Commission's proposal on the CBAM. Uh, as a starting point in the com coming negotiations, I think it helps to answer two questions. Is the CBAM possible at all? And is it an appropriate measure? My conclusion and my answer to this uh, is yes, both questions, but under some conditions. Firstly, the CBAM is only possible if it is legal and totally in line with the global trading system, tra trading rules. And the only rational for a CBAM must be an environmental one, reducing global CO2 emissions and preventing carbon leakage. No emissions should be priced twice and no production should be protected twice, and in the end, the polluter shall always pay the price for the carbon emissions. As it is clear, the rationale behind introducing the CBAM is to lower global emissions uh, through reducing the risk for carbon leakage. It is also clear that we must strictly keep to this when designing this mechanism. Therefore, we must never be tempted to start to subsidize our emissions when they are exported out of the Union. That would be like pulling the rug out from, uh, from under us in setting up the CBAM, and we, could, we would no longer have a case in the W2 for introducing the mechanism as an urgent, urgent response to the, to the climate crisis. We must treat all goods equally and always provide incentives for going green. It's necessary to keep strictly to this, not only to ensure WTO compatibility, but also to reduce the risk for CBAM creating trade tensions with our partners. And therefore, we must not include any references to CBAM increasing competitiveness of EU companies in CBAM. Not to say that this is not an important effect of creating a CBAM, but it cannot be the rationale behind creating it. The effectiveness of the mechanism must be studied continuously through impact assessments and it must be continued with full transparency and in discussions with our trading partners. I appreciate all the work by uh, the colleagues in the coming up with, with many smart, creative and necessary amendments with, to the Commission's proposal and I'm sure we will find a strong compromise here in our committee, but it will take a lot of time uh, and a lot of compromising. It has to be said, because it is clear that reading the amendments that our views are on some central issue is just diverging. But as I said, I'm sure that we, in, uh, in the end, in the committee, we will have a, a strong position uh, from the European Parliament, and it will be in line with the WTO rules. So, uh, colleagues, I'm looking forward to the debate and the negotiations very much. And, uh, well, this is the time. So... Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Karin. Now the shadow rapporteurs for two and a half minutes each. Mr. Salini is the first. Grazie. Thank you. Now, this operation is a very valuable operation in terms of um, industry and the environment. Because CBAM is not only possible, but it's necessary, to repeat what the rapporteur was saying. Well, why is it necessary? Because for the purposes which we have in mind, the current measures it turned out not to be sufficient. They were not sufficient to avoid the risk of carbon leakage. We need something more than what we have at the moment. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today talking about this. However, let's be careful here. We shouldn't think that, well, one of the issues uh, on which there will be a bit of a fight, a constructive fight, will be the question of export. Now, it's said that CBAM uh, applies to imports but not for exports because it's not a trade protection mechanism. Ah, but be careful here because if the environmental reasons uh, apply to imports, 
to say that they don't exist for exports would lead us uh, to uh, possibly run the risk of uh, uh, ditching the whole provision. Uh, it might get bogged down because the, the two threats do exist. So let's be careful. We shouldn't just protect ourselves from criticisms which might be leveled by the WTO. We don't want to, to protect it to such an extent that we kill it. And then we have the question of the free allocations. Now, the EPP believes that the time has not come to do away quite happily at the uh, free of charge allowances. We'll have a time to, we'll have a certain amount of time to check this out. And uh, we believe that this should be between 2026 and 2028, before 2030, when we will have occasion and we'll be in a position to really assess the impact of CBAM on our companies. And then we'll be able to work out in an intelligent fashion and technically speaking in a, 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 a undisputable way exactly how to come up with a reduction of the free allowances until we find, phase them out altogether. So this is the approach which we would uh, suggest, particularly as far as circumvention is concerned, Article 27. We've already got a fairly good agreement, and I'm very grateful to the rapporteur for that. And we're available to continue with these negotiations, which won't be easy, but I think that we've got off to an excellent start. Thank you. Grazie. Kathleen von Bremen, two and a half minutes. Thank you very much, Chair, and welcoming also the rapporteur of CBAM in the Envy Committee. Um, but I will address uh, my words first of all to Karen. Uh, first of all, let me thank Karen for an excellent report and a very open-minded start of the negotiations. Um, and I have to say, everything she said today, um, the S&D Group agrees with. That doesn't mean that we do not have different approaches when it comes to the details of amendments and so on. Let's, let's take the negotiations to do that. But in the principles that you said outline, the S&D group agrees. Huh? We have the carbon border adjustment because we have a green deal and we have carbon neutrality by 2050. And to be able to do so, there will be a fast strengthening of the ETS mechanism and the ending of the free allowances. And to make that acceptable and defendable for our industry, we introduced the CBAM. It is not the other way around, and I want to stress that because I have to say I'm really worried about um, the EPP um, um, uh, positioning here um, about the free allowances. Um, first of all, it is in contradiction with the Green Deal and um, the strengthening of ETS, but secondly, it is unacceptable within the WTO, and maybe we should ask an advice from the WTO or get a decent um, uh, wording on that, but you, can, but you cannot say that for the imports you introduce a carbon border adjustment and you keep on protecting your industry with free allowances. That will not be acceptable. Where I think we can find a good compromise and has already been work done is on circumvention. Because of course we need to make sure that uh, companies outside the European Union do not try to go behind or next to the CBAM um, uh, um, and, and to make sure that we have uh, an equal competition in that sense. So that is for um, the S&D key, and um, uh, um, I want to stress that. Um, the same goes for export rebates. I think that is uh, clear. What we want to introduce as well is the, in, the, the fact that we need not just the direct cost, but also the indirect cost um, uh, within CBAM. And the last point is also very important when it comes to our trading partners in least developed countries. Uh, um, and I know we have discussions with uh, especially budget people uh, on, on how to deal with the revenues. Uh, let's aside the technicalities of these discussions on the budget, but let's agree upon the fact that the reven revenues, one way or the other, should be used to help least developed countries to get in line um, with the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, Manuela Ripa for the Greens. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Karin, for all your work you have done so far. As we are discussing today amendments, I'm happy to present the amendments that are important to our group. The climate crisis is a global crisis. We heard it many times. We need an effective global instrument, and we as Europeans, we can present such a tool. And in order to achieve our climate goals, we 
certainly need to be ambitious. Therefore, we believe that we need to introduce the CBAM pricing mechanism as soon as possible by January 2025. Regarding free allocations of allowances, at the moment, over 95% of EU industrial emissions are covered by free emission allowances. And let, let us be honest, the system is not working adequately. A CBAM can only achieve its aim of higher international climate ambition if it's designated to provide real incentives for the industry within and outside the EU to reduce their emissions. Both free allocations under UTS and compensation for indirect emission costs weaken the price signal that the system provides and at the same time affect the incentives for investments into further reduction of emissions. Therefore, we need, believe that we need an early phase out and that we have to include indirect emissions right from the start. CBAM must be a fully climate protection measure and therefore there is no space for formal competitiveness. CBAM must be a fully climate protection measure and therefore um, we have to fully respect the WTO compatibility. In fighting the climate change, we cannot allow us to leave least developed countries behind. Um, it was already just mentioned. As we have to act globally to reduce emissions, we need adequate measures for LDCs, notably CBAM revenues, to majorly devote to them. We can agree to make concessions on the exclusion of LTCs, but in that case, we would like to see an ambitious outcome of resources. When it comes to enlargement of the product scope to all other ETS products and downstream products, the Commission shall present a legislative proposal before the end of this legislation. And in order for this mechanism to come to life, we indeed have to create a competent CBAM authority at EU level. But regarding these details, we should leave it to our envy, um, to the envy committee. Moreover, we need more sound procedures for the calculation of embedded emissions in third country installation and we must avoid loopholes. Therefore, the rules on circumvention have to be very strong. And lastly, on the export remates, we remain, un we remain unconvinced that this can be WTA compatible. I'm looking forward to work with all of you in a good text in order to introduce an effective CBAM as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Mr. Lacini, two and a half minutes. Grazie, Presidente. Grazie. Thank you, Chair, and I'd like to thank the Rapporteur for uh, the, her work in this important area. Now, more ambition with regard to the climate requires protection from carbon leakage. In order to reach objectives to protect the environment, it is essential to create the appropriate conditions so that important European industrial sectors, which are exposed to international competition, are still competitive throughout the transition phase. These industries should be able to carry out the, the substantial investment required. CBAM should protect our companies to avoid Competition from outside the EU with legislation which is less demanding in terms of climate change um, so that this type of legislation doesn't destroy our industrial fabric. Now, the introduction of CBAM is quite complex and there are all sorts of difficulties in terms of implementing it. So we need to implement it very slowly, gradually, to check how effective it is because otherwise we might compromise the competitive edge of our strategic industries, the, mainly the manufacturing industry in Europe, um, without actually obtaining proper climate change results. Now, the anti-carbon leakage uh, in the current ETS directive with the uh, free of charge allowances and the uh, compensation for indirect uh, costs, all of this uh, should uh, apply up to 2030 even for sectors which would enter into the field of application of the mechanism to ensure proper legal certainty and fair conditions for investment for companies concerned by this transition. Now, the CBAM proposal only deals with imports, but it doesn't deal with the competition on non-EU markets. Now, European production uh, has to contend with increasing ETS costs, and in many sectors it could find itself in an impossible situation and not able to compete with other uh, companies. There are no measures concerning 
exports which are referred to here, and it would be important to have some sort of export adjustment mechanism which would be compatible with the WTO. It's also important to strengthen Article 27 on the circumvention of risks uh, because the Commission proposal provides for weak uh, countermeasures and they're quite limited. Now, the control and verification procedures have been made more uh, robust and dealing with fraud uh, is uh, the measures taken here are improved. But a lot of decisions have been simply postponed. And uh, according to the Commission, they'll only be dealt with after the final uh, approval of the primary legislation. So we might end up voting for an empty uh, box without giving a clear picture for our companies and for their future investments. So the rules of the game have to be defined very, very carefully right from the outset with the appropriate uh, contributions from member states and the parliament. Yet bourgeois, two and a half minutes. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. For well, our group is in favour of a proper CBAM instrument uh, so that we can uh, ensure a level playing field for EU industry. And I would really like to thank the rapporteur for the report. But in a good democratic debate, of course, with that in mind, we have tabled amendments on crucial points. We're rather worried about the effect of the proposed instrument in terms of the competitive edge of our European companies, and in particular, with regard to our downstream industry. Things have to be taken into account to a greater extent here. Now, we're against the idea of uh, a quicker phasing out of the free of charge allowances, and we're against the proposal of bringing everything forward by one year. We think that a proper impact analysis needs to be carried out before we decide to speed things up. I think that this uh, is pretty logical. And then there's the question of indirect uh, emissions. If we've no clear estimate of what these could be, if we don't have a proper impact assessment, uh, we should not include them as yet. And the Commission would also need to assess the uh, carbon leakage issue for our exporting uh, European companies. We need also to ensure that the Commission has the appropriate diplomatic channels with the appropriate partners. Um, also in the international forums, such as the WTO. Now, we would not like to um, earmark the um, CBAM uh, revenue. That's something which Budge should deal with, not like us, not a, a committee such as ours. We think that the appropriate measure should be taken uh, to make sure that there's no circumvention. We want uh, more refined measures to combat that, and CBAM must be totally compatible with WTO provisions. And, uh, and then when you have non-market uh, non trading countries such as China, uh, their position must be taken into account, and this is very important for us. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, Emmanuel Morel, two and a half minutes. Can you hear me, Chair? Well, yes, this is a dossier which is absolutely essential, absolutely crucial for the credibility of the European Union when it comes to the fight against climate change. And in particular, something that has been um, difficult for us to deal with, and that is to say carbon leakage. Now, I would like to thank the rapporteur for her um, serious work, the work that she has carried out. And indeed, we have to succeed 
here, because even though we have divergent views, some colleagues say that we have to completely um, comply with WTO regulations and that we can't call them into question. I myself have some doubts about that. However, I would like to share with you some remarks and some, let's say, concerns. First concern, as I said to the trade minister, the French trade minister, um, just the other day, we do not want this to start with a bang and end with a whimper. Now we're at a figure of 800 million for the provisional budget, and I'm worried because that's not going to have much of an effect at all. Secondly, and I believe that Mrs. Carlsbaugh is very conscious of this, and the President of the Commission, the Commissioner as well, we believe that the scope is, is, is not broad enough. We really need to think about this. We need to also look at indirect emissions too. Now, the problem of the price is another one. We see it's about eight, 80 euros for a tonne of CO2 right now on the market. Now, when we look at the IPCC um, reports, we see that 80 euros, well, that's okay well, for the current situation. However, moving forward, we're not sure if that's going to be enough. Indeed, by the time that the CBAM actually enters into force, this price may have actually dropped significantly. significantly. So, I believe that we need to make sure that we have um, a handle on the prices so that they are always um, able to, be, to help us reach our objectives. And, perhaps, my final point is that if we... Um, have a calculation method that is not too difficult, and I believe that that's something that's good, because the more difficult we render it, the more of an impact it's going to have on the good functioning of the market. So I believe that these are some of the issues we need to address, and I believe that we're capable of doing it. Thank you. Envio Rapporteur from the lead committee, Mohamed Chaim, for two and a half minutes as well. Welcome, Mohamed. Thank you very much, Chair. I thought I had three minutes, but I can do it in two and a half. <laughs> it will very, I think it will very, already be very difficult. Uh, thank you, Chair. I mean, um, I'm happy to come here to have a debate on, the, on, the, on my report, which I think um, we've had talks with many organizations, NGOs, scientists, uh, colleagues in Parliament, of course, uh, Madam, Madam uh, Kalsbro, and... Um, this is the result after uh, a lot of uh, talks and thinking and, uh, and processing of, of, of ideas and arguments. Let me first very clearly state, it cannot be stressed enough that the CBAM mechanism is in first place a climate measure. It's not a protectionist measure or a way to increase revenues for our own resources. The idea is a climate measure. And I think this has to be, this has to be the core of the proposal. Um, and I do believe that ultimately the CBAM should be an obsolete measure. That uh, because our trade partners will also include carbon pricing. Uh, and until then, I think the objective is to create a different, an alternative carbon leakage measure. And at the same time, replace free allocations. They go a bit hand in hand. And to be honest, I welcome countermeasures from other countries. If it's exactly in line with the CBAM measure we have developed in the EU. So I welcome bilateral, multilateral, as Mr. Bourgeois said, discussions to set up these type of mechanisms, border adjustment mechanism related to climate, environment, specifically uh, in, in the same line and thinking as we are now doing in the EU. I think it will be very necessary to create this. And maybe this could lead to an international carbon market where the price of CO2 in China should be the same as the price of CO2 within the EU. Um, um, so I think it's very important to stress that. And I, I, of course, for this perspective, I also look at your, as a colleagues in the intercommittee. And I'm very uh, looking forward to your ideas on the circumvention, on circumvention, I think it's a very important point. I was a bit late, but uh, uh, Madame Van Brent and some others also talked about it, uh, to strengthen the, the proposal that we have on the table. Um, I've, had, I've had a talk with Madame Kalsbro, and I think I've 
uh, without any questioning, copied her ideas on how to include the LDCs in this proposal. I think you can see even in the wording that we've uh, we've looked at the report that was uh, that was uh, accepted in uh, uh, that, that she presented uh, in, in INTA. Uh, because I do believe that this measure should not disproportionately affect LDCs. And when it comes to the export rebates, I have to follow both Madam Kalsbro and uh, Madam Ripa. I. At this stage, I'm looking at you. Whether you can find a solution for export rebates, please, if you think you can find a solution that's WTO compatible, please tell us. But I don't see it at this stage, and I don't think we should set up uh, 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 export rebates to uh, subsidy, subsidize uh, carbon production or the, uh, the production or the, the, the exports of pro products the, without, uh, without being um, without paying a CO2 price. So if you have any ideas, Des, please, te please tell me. I I'm, I'm following the discussion, even though last time I wasn't here, due to other meetings in this committee, uh, with a lot of interest, and I look forward to collaborate with you, cooperate with you to make sure that this mechanism at the end is a mechanism that fulfills uh, uh, the climate perspective and gives us clear message to countries out, producers outside Europe that if you want to sell your product in the European market, we will hold you on the exact same conditions we are asking our own producers. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Chair Mohamed. So I gave you two and a half minutes and you took four. I, if I would have given you three, I think you would have taken five. So, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Christoph. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Bernd, for giving me the floor. I wasn't on the speaker's list, but nonetheless, I would just uh, react a little bit because I'm a bit, little bit confused in which committee are we here, in the Inter committee or in the Butch committee or in the DEVE committee, because we have still uh, to, sco to cope uh, and sco uh, keep us on the scope of the Inter committee, which is trade-related and not development-related, even though that might come in on other places, but it is not our duty here. And uh, when we are now spending the money that is coming in, and by the way, it's the European companies and importers that are going to pay this, and not the Chinese or whoever producer. So I'm really, really shocked that we are now giving this away. Uh, this is, uh, uh, in my opinion, it should be used internally to adapt our industry to an energy transition, to use different energy sources. That can be thought about, but giving the money away, I'm wondering if this is even aligned with Gentiloni's uh, uh, position and the interinstitutional uh, agreement where this should be in the EU own, own resources. I don't think so, but if I uh, missed something, please let me know. Okay, I, I'm sure we will have further intensive discussion about some relevant questions. So, uh, short reaction by the Commission. Ms. Scopio and Madeleine Tuninga is there. Max five minutes together. Ms. Scopio. Thank you very much, Chairman. And many thanks also to the rapporteur, uh, Mrs. Calbro, and to the honorable members who filed the amendments. As you have just mentioned, Mrs. Tuninga from DG Trade will complete today's intervention from the Commission. I am from DG Taxu, and I'm in charge of the CBAN proposal. And uh, I have taken duly note of the different reports that have been presented until now, among others, the most important here we are discussing today, the Inter report. The amendments uh, that have been presented uh, hugely differ from one another. Uh, you have, from one hand, the ones that tend to be more ambitious, wishing to have a quicker implementation or a wider scope, while another camp of um, amendments tend to be more prudent and hence uh, less ambitious on uh, the potentiality of the, of the proposal. This, com this is confirming the fact that probably our proposal stands in the middle and achieves the right compromise and a balanced approach. Uh, as far as the less ambitious uh, um, proposals, we would like to say we are a bit worried by the proposal to maintain free allowances until the effectiveness of the CBAM is demonstrated. First of all, this would um, testify for a mistrust of the European institution in the system we are about to um, adopt. And also, there would be a, a wrong belief that free allowances can stay for longer than they are expected to stay alive. CBAM is an alternative to free allowance. The two cannot live at the same time 
in, um, in the legal um, world. They are uh, supposed to enter into force gradually, and CBAM will enter into force as long as free allowances will be phased out. It is understandable that there are discussion on the actual length of the phasing in, phasing out. Of course, of course, uh, the this discussion will happen in the context of the discussion on the uh, ETS directive. But our proposal is uh, based on solid principles that are compatible with WTO. And uh, uh, in uh, um, all respect, as I said, progressive phasing in should be mirrored by progressive phasing out of free allowances. Other amendments that we have uh, looked with uh, somewhat some concern are the ones suggesting an exclusion of third countries which have deep and comprehensive free trade agreement with the EU or are part of the Energy Community Treaty. In this respect, we cannot support any exclusion that it is not based on the double pricing, on the no double pricing principle. Only Norway and Switzerland, which are fully in, linked with the ETS, can benefit from a full exclusion. This would be against at odds with WTO to ensure exclusions that would go beyond what is um, in this uh, no um, double pricing principle. On this, we would like to be firm and uh, uh, consider that uh, any uh, amendment that would go beyond would change the nature of the instrument as such. As far as the um, possible blanket exclusion for the least developed um, countries, uh, um, I have to say that the total exclusion may seem to be a difficult option. Again, because this would be very difficult to be defended in front of the WTO. Nonetheless, we uh, will uh, try to see for uh, other ways to um, uh, help this uh, LDC, this L the LDC countries, and all the uh, elements will feed the, the discussion. As far as the most important uh, um, amendment that has been presented and that is very controversial, the uh, export competitiveness. Uh, we um, understand the issue. This is very important for companies and we are ready to look at solutions that could be compatible with the nature of, of CBAM. In particular, we would like to support companies under the Innovation Fund. This would be very um, compatible with WTO and would not uh, create problems. Um, finally, we note the strengthening of uh, um, the, um, um, counter, com the countervailing uh, measures, the, um, the, the anti-convention measures, sorry, that it is called by all groups, and we will uh, follow up with that. Um, sorry if I took a bit longer. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. So, Madeleine, do you want to come in for one minute, or is it not necessary? So good, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Am I uh, am I on screen? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Now let me uh, thanks um, thanks everybody and all. Um, um, of, um, thank you all for the um, uh, good debate and, and good inputs. I I think everything has been said. I would just like to highlight the real importance for us also as we take forward the integration of the Green Deal in our trade policy activities. It is really important that we um, make sure that this instrument is and remains uh, compatible with the WTO. We believe the way we designed it is compatible. Um, I've had heard to discussions on free allowances and there's also discussion on export rebates. I think our position is known. It is key for our credibility. Um, uh, and it's not only a legal issue. As you know, we are also full steam engaging on environment and climate matters in the WTO. Um, there is um, a, such an, an, a curiosity to, to our instruments, but that balance can uh, quickly derail if uh, our instruments are either not compatible with the WTO or if we are perceived to be protectionistic. So also from a policy point of view, it's really important that we design this in a manner that is um, compatible with the WTO. That's all I, uh, I wanted to add. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Madeleine. Karin, a conclusion remark. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank you for a very good and fresh debate. I think it's very good when we really have discussions on the content of what we are working with. It will make the negotiations easier when we know where we are. 
just some remarks. Um, nothing, absolutely nothing, should be more efficient than a global price on uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Um, based on the, I think, ancient principle of polluter pays principle. And I think we should do our best to avoid any kind of green protectionism or greenwashing trade when we are designing the CBAM. Um, I think there are many, many good examples of green tran transition in the European industry. Uh, the industry uh, is very used to pricing uh, car to the ETS and to, to pricing carbon emissions right now. So we should we shouldn't fall in the trap and not be tempted to start to make to, to design any subsidies uh, for carbon emissions. That would really to to uh, move in the wrong direction uh, back in time. CBAM uh, is a market oriented oriented mechanism, and I think it's a it's a very good example how you can promote trade and uh, compatibility, uh, competitiveness and uh, the fight against carbon emissions at the same time. So I think we should try to the, uh, stick to these very, very basic principles. When it comes to the revenues, um, very short, I think that it's very natural that we, when we talk about the revenues, uh, see how it can be not given away, as I heard. I would say that we should see it naturally, that it's a resource that we can use for invest in the fight against um, climate change. And if we just put the revenues in our own pockets, we will not be so strong in the WTO as if we can say that we invest globally. So if you like CBAM, you also have to like WTO and work together uh, and in line with the trade rules. But I'm looking forward to the next discussion and the negotiation which takes place, start to take place this week. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Indeed, I guess next month you have a lot of work to negotiate the uh, more than 500 amendments. Uh, so uh, hopefully we will have then the vote on the 28th of February. Thanks a lot. This concludes the item uh, 17. We switch immediately to item 18 and we have to rush. We have only 20 minutes because at 4 o'clock uh, we have to close. Um, there is a discussion about a specific uh, instrument treaty in the WHO and they are starting to negotiate about that regarding the strengthening the pandemic prevention. And I give immediately Ms. Bevilia Sampetti the floor for a maximum of five minutes. Mrs. Bevigla, you have the floor, plus the speak button once at the bottom of your screen, please. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I will be brief. Um, just a few uh, points of information for you to uh, situate uh, this uh, initiative. In the run-up to the World Health Assembly uh, in May last year, um, there, there, there was a lot of discussion on the establishment of an international agreement on pandemics. Uh, the aim of such uh, an agreement is to forge a high-level commitment towards a more robust global health architecture. The initiative uh, was supported politically by about uh, 30 head of states and governments, including several EU member states, uh, as well as the president of the European Council. At the May session of the World Health Assembly, uh, it was decided to convene a special session uh, at the end of November uh, 2021 uh, to um, consider the benefits uh, of developing a WHO convention or other international instrument on pandemic uh, preparedness and response. The special session adopted a decision on 1st December 2021 to initiate the, the negotiation for 
for a new international agreement. We believe this is an important step forward towards strengthening uh, pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. It shows uh, what can be achieved through multilateralism when uh, uh, countries work together in a spirit of uh, close cooperation. Uh, we are only at the beginning of the process, I must stress, and we still have a very long road ahead of us uh, before this instrument will be uh, hopefully in place. The decision of the special session, however, gave us a, a good opportunity to make uh, a difference for global health security and to reinforce the international legal framework in light, of course, of the lesson learned uh, in the last few months. We see an important role for international law in improving preparedness for and response to future pandemics and combating serious cross-border threats to health at national, regional, and international level. An international agreement uh, anchored uh, to the principle of the human rights uh, to health, international solidarity and equity, as well as One Health, uh, setting stronger objectives for cooperation and standards and obligation for state, and a reinforced role for international institutions is a crucial tool in our collective response to the pandemic risks present and future. We are well aware that this is not a complete solution, but if undertaken in the conjunction with uh, domestic health system strengthening, it can provide a more robust uh, international preparedness uh, and response framework. We believe the new agreement should strike a balance between achieving concrete and rapid results in key areas and charting the course for future work in a number of highly complex areas of cooperation, which uh, would no, uh, no doubt require a longer negotiation time. In addition, we believe uh, targeted improvements to the uh, 2005 International Health Regulation can also play a, a, an important role together with uh, an overall strengthening of the WHO, which should remain the central agency for global health. We now need to set in motion a, a process of international cooperation among state and all relevant stakeholders. Ultimately, the aim uh, of the new international agreement, legally binding under international law, is to forge a strong commitment towards a more robust uh, global health architecture. Um, the new agreement should address gaps in, in, in the existing international regulatory framework and promote prevention and response uh, uh, arrangements, governance and oversight mechanism, uh, stronger health system and equitable access to countermeasures and uh, uh, provide predictable funding uh, as well as technical assistance and capacity building, especially for low and lower middle income countries. Um, on December 1st, uh, 2021, uh, uh, the Commission has adopted a recommendation for a Council decision and asking the Council to authorize the Commission to open and conduct negotiation on behalf of the EU for the conclusion of such new international agreement, as well as for the negotiation of complementary amendments to the International Health Regulation of 2005. We trust the Council will adopt the negotiating directives as soon as possible so as to secure an effective participation of the Union in the negotiation process. Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks a lot. So, one minute for Christoph Hansen. So, Ivant, I wasn't prepared, so I thought it was my colleague Jürgen Barbon who should speak. So he... Okay, so I have Christoph here, but Jürgen, please. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, yes, I welcome the, that we uh, bring up the trade-related aspect of uh, this planned treaty uh, today. Uh, there is, of course, a lot of questions both regarding to the process uh, and the content of, of this. Uh, there are uh, important issues like the IP issues. There are, of course, interesting parts about supply chains, about uh, production, transportation problems, export restrictions. So I really would like to know more about the content and how the Commission plans to 
uh, first of all, engage the Parliament in this in the future, and also how you plan to engage the uh, the businesses, the European businesses, so they also can 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 say uh, their say in 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 the, in, uh, in the future about this. And my final question uh, is about uh, if this WHO treaty will be enough to meet all the, uh, all the necessary steps we have to take when it comes to trade especially. Thank you. Excellent. Catherine van Bem, one minute. Well, a little bit in the same line. This is the International Trade Committee, so we're very interested in what would be the trade pillar or the trade component of, uh, of these negotiations. Um, uh, we all saw that uh, during the pandemic, the trade part was extremely important. We had all of a sudden a lot of shortages. Think about the face mask, the hand gel, the ventilators, the painkillers. In the West, we sort of resolved that problem uh, quite quickly. But in, uh, in the South, that remained a huge problem deep into the pandemic. And we see, as we all know, the same when it comes to vaccination um, uh, and, and, and the access uh, to vaccination as a public health. So um, for us, that discussion uh, is really important, also the connection to the IP discussion. So my questions. Do you have a mandate already from, from the European Council? I think you said no, but can you please elaborate on that? And will there be a, a specific trade pillar within the mandate um, uh, of the Council? And I would be interested uh, to see the views of the Commission, especially on the trade part. Is there a non-paper um, uh, uh, getting into the details of that negotiations? And what is the timetable? What are we facing here uh, in the timetable? And how can we prepare from the European Parliament and this committee the trade part um, of that negotiations? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Samira. Thank you very much, Chair. Do I have one minute or one and a half? One minute. Oh, one minute. But okay, I'm sorry. not totally I strict. Okay. Just to be sure. So, um, first of all, I would like to know, uh, just like my, my colleagues, how the Commission will work closely with the parliaments on the elements included in a future pandemic treaty. So, how are you planning to cooperate and engage the European Parliament? And then, on, um, when it comes to, uh, to the trade part, uh, I, I really wonder how the Commission will ensure uh, the incorporation of trade policy and strategy um, it's very important that we have certain trade ele elements incorporated here. And which elements would you say are the most fruitful to address on the short-term preparations for a treaty? Um, also, I am very curious on how the discussion within the WTO on, for example, TRIPS feed into the eventual text of a pandemic treaty. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And Heidi Hautala. Hello. Um, yes, uh, I think this is a very welcome initiative. And um, my question is that, um, as uh, so far, uh, the EU has failed uh, to use the unique window of opportunity to condition the ex-ante financing of research and development and ex-post advanced purchase agreements of vaccines uh, with requirements to share technology and non-exclusive patent licensing. So. Um, is, uh, has the Commission now um, taken lessons from this? And th is this going to be uh, the um, uh, starting point for the negotiations on this international instrument? And as you mentioned, the, the negotiation mandate. So can you confirm that also this negotiation mandate, like free trade agreement negotiation mandates, for instance, will be public as soon as they have been adopted by the Council? Yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, but Heidi, uh, I guess we get and have an agreement with the uh, Commission that they will present the mandate to us before they uh, will get it uh, to the uh, Council so that we are fully informed about the process. I hope this is also valid for this uh, uh, treaty negotiation. So uh, the Commission has now the possibility, Mr. Uh, Sampetti, but also Mr. Vajant from DG Trade to answer uh, together uh, in six minutes maximum. Mr. Sampetti, please. Mr. Zambetti, please press the speak button once. Thank you. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, I we can hear you. Again. We can. 
<laughs> Great, thanks, thanks a lot. And uh, uh, so uh, once more, I was saying uh, many thanks for the uh, interest in the in the initiative and uh, and for the, for the questions. Um, uh, as for the uh, uh, involvement of the European Parliament, of course, the, the Commission will follow all uh, existing rules and and practices uh, in this regard. Uh, in particular, uh, I would note that the. Um, uh, the uh, recommendation for a council decision uh, to open the negotiation wo uh, is public and was uh, uh, transmitted to, to, the, to the parliament. Uh, and we also already had one uh, uh, hearing in the, in the MV uh, committee, which is, uh, I think, the committee responsible for, for this uh, area of work. The, negotiating, uh, uh, the negotiation authorization and negotiating directive have not yet been uh, adopted. We hope for a swift uh, adoption, but uh, discussion in Council seem to take a little while. Uh, nonetheless, we hope that they will be uh, uh, ready and adopted by, uh, uh, by February. Uh, as such, in the negotiating directive, there is no specific uh, trade component. Uh, of course, uh, we cannot exclude that uh, the um, element related to trade may take uh, 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 a higher profile in discussions uh, with partners, but for the moment uh, we have not included a, a specific uh, uh, element in the negotiating directive with respect to, uh, to trade. Uh, the Commission has prepared a um, paper back in August, which is uh, public, uh, where we note uh, uh, in a, in a, in a over 10-page paper in just one paragraph, <clears throat> we note that nonetheless uh, promoting the reduction of trade barriers uh, is, uh, is uh, an important uh, uh, overall objective, but how that may uh, then materialize in the negotiation is uh, perhaps too early uh, to say. In any event, this negotiation will take uh, quite a while, so uh, the, the, uh, this, the current discussion within the WTO, in particular on the TRIPS waiver, uh, would hopefully be uh, uh, concluded uh, well before we get into the thick of the negotiation on this, uh, on this new uh, instrument. Um, uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And Mr. Vajant, you want to come in for the trade part? Yes, thank you, Chair. Indeed, as a complement to uh, what uh, Americo just explained regarding the, um, the treaty on pandemics, I just wanted also to explain the articulation between these uh, initiatives and the WTO discussion that are ongoing. So, um, if you recall, the, the, the EU has presented in the, in the context of the WTO already in December 2019, together with other Ottawa Group members, uh, trade and health initiatives. We were quite confident to be able to conclude this element, including an IP part, uh, as part of the uh, uh, declaration that should have, have been adopted uh, in the context of the ministerial conference uh, number 12 that should have taken place in November. But uh, because of the postponement of this meeting, uh, also the, the related uh, declaration have been postponed. But we are actively engaged now uh, on all the fronts in order to be able to agree on declaration on trade and else that would include an IP front. Um, just for the, uh, the scope of this, uh, of this um, declaration will be quite uh, comprehensive. It will certainly seek also to achieve the same goal, but just with a focus on trade. And it is not a question that we're related to, to, to raised by some of the members, we're presently on, on that part. So uh, the elements are quite uh, that are still object of discussion currently with uh, different uh, WTO members are covering all the different aspects uh, that uh, were considered as key uh, for the EU, um, thinking about transparency and monitoring, which is precisely one of the key problems was the access to information and transparency of supply chains, but also transparency as regards the measure taken on, uh, by uh, WTO members and notably regarding export prohibition and export restriction. So it is certainly a discipline that we seek to, to, to develop. But in addition to this, and also obviously the IP part, which, I, which is their object of a standalone discussion in the TRIPS committee. But then there is also, precisely regarding the Treaty on Pandemics, uh, a request, and at least it is uh, actively promoted by, the, by the, the, the Commission and the EU, it is precisely to make sure that also the different international organizations are well coordinating the action in, in, in moment of crisis. And this is where we see a, a high value 
in order to precisely uh, reinforce the coordination and cooperation between WTO and WHO as, a, as well as WCO. So as part of this, um, of this uh, trade and health declaration that we seek to be adopted in the coming weeks, uh, there, there, we are quite confident also that it is possible to deepen the cooperation and then it is there where we, we see a value uh, through this cooperation between the two institutions to be able precisely to fit one with the other. This is why in cooperation with Digital Sante we have been uh, making sure that there is also, um, as part of the EU proposal uh, in the Treaty on Pandemics, uh, the essence of the proposal that is currently being discussed in WTO, which is reflected there precisely in order to make the bridge between these two initiatives. Thank you for your attention, and I uh, hope I have been clear in my explanation. Thanks a lot for the information, and uh, of course we will have an eye on that, and we'll come back to that. It will be a longer story, I guess, uh, so uh, we will follow this uh, quite closely. Thanks a lot. This uh, leads to a short break until quarter to five. Thanks a lot.